So good morning, everyone. Could you have your attention, please? I'd like to welcome all the attendees and participants to the first of three round session uh, of the webinar on the topic of ge geoeconomic relevance of Southeast Asia for the Italian country, uh, CISO. Uh, my name is Salvatore Casabona. I am a, an associate professor, dean of the master's degree in international trade and studies. Um, we, have, um, we have with this session a great and remarkable session that will cover the policies and strategies of the Italian European uh, um, promotion in Asia, as well as the trade performances and uh, initiatives of uh, cultural cooperation of Sicily in Southeast Asia. Um, ambassador, experts, policy makers, entrepreneurs have been. Uh, uh, involved in uh, in a depth analysis of this uh, topic, so it is great, really my my great pleasure to uh, to launch this new initiative uh, with the cooperation of the uh, Association Italian Asian. That uh, I, I'm, I'm really I express my sincere gratitude to uh, uh, Valerio Bordonaro, who is the director of the uh, of the association that uh, strongly support the University of Palermo in organizing uh, all uh, the, the panels, as well as Sich Industria, as well as the European Enterprise Network, that uh, is, a, mm, I mean, an historical partner and a sponsor of the master degree in international trade, and, and also here provide for the platform on which our uh, seminar will be delivered. Um, this initiative is uh, uh, perfectly consistent with the interest of our master degree in our department in the topics regarding Asia. Uh, we have um, uh, several um, important relationships with uh, um, Asia countries, China, uh, Far East uh, Asia, uh, as China, Japan and Taiwan, but also Southeast Asia. We just stipulated a mobility agreement with the Foreign Trade University of Hanoi. And, uh, and we also provide as department uh, executive, executive education for um, high uh, official or, and uh, uh, public officials of the Ministry of Home Affairs in Vienna. Uh, and so there is an history of cooperation in, uh, in doing this kind uh, of uh, stuff. Uh, so uh, let me introduce very briefly our guest today before uh, leaving the floor to uh, Valerio. Um, I would like to introduce to you Her Excellency Ms. Esti Adayani, Ambassador in Tunisia. Well, good morning, good morning, Ambassador, and thank you very much for having good accepting our invitation. Uh, uh, Ms. Silvia Formentini from the DG Trade European Commission at CN Desk, thank you very much for joining our session, Silvia. And uh, Ms. Alessia Mosca, Secretary, Secretary General of uh, the Association Italian Asia. Thank you very much for having supported and our uh, our first initiatives. And I, for the benefits of our students, we have just uh, an, um, signed an agreement with the Association Italian Asia that is also open to uh, uh, to have trainee from our courses. And so I strongly hope that this first session will be uh, the first of a long-lasting history of cooperation between our department and course and, and the association. So um, thank you very much. I, I hope that you will enjoy our webinar session. Uh, can be interesting, fascinating and stimulating. I'm pretty sure about this. Valerio, you have the floor. Thank you, Salvatore. Uh, distinguished panelists and guests, I'm particularly happy today to chair and moderate this meeting, as it is the first time since I left Palermo almost 15 years ago um, that I'm organizing an event in my hometown. Uh, I won't take any more time from our today's discussion. Um, as said before, I'm the director of Italy ASEAN Association, and we will have three sessions, three rounds of discussion uh, during the next weeks. Uh, so we'll have plenty of time to uh, deepen a topic like uh, as how Southeast Asia could be fundamental for our country system. Uh, but as said before, I'm honored now to give the floor to Alessia Mosca. Alessia is the Secretary General of the Italy ASEAN Association, but also former member of the Italian Parliament and of the European Parliament, where she was in charge of trade, um, of, of some trade topics for the um, Socialist and Democrat group. So Alessia will have to leave us uh, a little bit in advance 
So you can use the function uh, question, domande, uh, to, uh, ask, uh, to ask questions to Alessia during her intervention. And now, Alessia, we, I, we, I think we are all eager uh, to listen to your views about trade and globalization. So I will immediately start. Alessia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Valeria. Thank you uh, uh, for the organization, uh, to all the organizers of this uh, very, very interesting meeting. And I'm uh, really honored to start this uh, cooperation uh, as Italia ASEAN uh, uh, with, uh, with the university. Uh, just a few words, very few words concerning the uh, association. Uh, we have been founded five years ago and uh, um, by, uh, by Eric Coretta, who is our president. And uh, uh, we basically um, uh, work on the relation, the institutional relations uh, between uh, Italy, uh, the ASEAN uh, countries, uh, the ASEAN as organization, and the European Union. Uh, so I'm, I really hope that uh, among our among the participants of today's sessions, uh, there will be someone that could be interested in what in what we do, and uh, we will be uh, uh, more than happy to welcome someone uh, that can uh, join us uh, in uh, in uh, this adventure. Um, I uh, I will uh, use uh, the time at my disposal uh, this morning uh, for uh, a general overview, not only on. Uh, uh, the ASEAN region and the relation that uh, Italy and Europe uh, is having with uh, with the ASEAN region, because I would leave uh, this part uh, to Silvia, who is uh, um, uh, more uh, expert than me, and uh, she will give you uh, a better, uh, more and more details uh, on that. I would like to introduce uh, and to give you a general idea of um, my idea of uh, what is going on uh, at a global level. Uh, on international relation and specifically on international trade. Um, uh, of course, uh, I will devote uh, the last part of my, uh, of my uh, lecture today on uh, something that I considered that I consider uh, so important uh, both for Europe and for the ASEAN region, uh, which is uh, the conclusion of the negotiation of this uh, very, very important agreement that, this, that has been signed this uh, uh, last weekend. Uh, the, uh, uh, regional comprehensive uh, um, uh, partnership that the uh, RECIP um, uh, among uh, uh, 15 ASEAN uh, countries. But let me start. Um, let me start with uh, something concerning uh, um, international trade in general. Uh, where we are now and which uh, are uh, the impact that uh, we uh, that. Uh, uh, the COVID uh, created on uh, international trade, because of course we are living a very, very special time, uh, a, a terrible time uh, for, for many reasons, uh, and uh, uh, we are all trying to cope with uh, this situation uh, that of course had also a huge, a dramatic impact also on uh, international trade. Um, the first, uh, the first wave of the pandemic uh, at the beginning of this year um, uh, really was uh, um, was uh, very, uh, very impactful on international trade, and uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, all the uh, uh, connection uh, had to stop, um, international trade witnessed a, a, a reduction of uh, flows uh, of goods and services uh, uh, a very very dramatic um, uh, uh, dramatic reduction everywhere in the world uh, some countries and some areas of the world have been more impacted than others but in general we had, we, we all experience such a huge uh, reduction um, what the, the good news is that after the reopening during uh, during the summer uh, or the, the reduction or the uh, uh, control of the pandemic during the months of the, uh, of, uh, of the summer, um, we witnessed as well a very fast uh, recovery of the exchanges, at least of uh, goods. Uh, um, and that um, led some analysts to uh, uh, judge the uh, pattern of the recovery as uh, a V-shaped pattern. Um, 
Oh, of course, uh, um, after that, uh, we still had to cope with another wave uh, where we are now. And that, uh, again, uh, is, uh, is giving another very difficult, very difficult uh, uh, impact uh, on global, global, uh, um, global uh, um, and international trade. But uh, um, the, all the elements that we have in our hands now uh, are saying that uh, this is a, um, a very dramatic change in uh, the way we live and the way we produce and in the way we, we exchange goods. But it won't cause the end uh, the, of globalization. On the contrary, uh, we think that globalization is uh, trying a new way uh, to uh, continue to be uh, uh, in place. And, uh, um, on, uh, uh, and the, 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 the message, the clearer message that we received from the period that we uh, lived uh, is that cooperation is uh, so essential, is even more essential now than ever, that could create even a better environment, perhaps a fairer environment also for, uh, um, for international trade. Uh, all of these challenges are uh, um, perfectly clear at the European institutional level. And for this reason, uh, um, the Commission uh, the former Commission, Phil Hogan, and the new Commission is continually continue to work on that. Um, uh, presented a uh, proposed a consultation that uh, an open consultation that has been uh, published uh, the 16th of June in order to uh, uh, collect ideas and have um, have inputs from uh, the stakeholders. Uh, in order to have a new mindset and to have a better and more uh, realistic idea of which could be the line, the direction that the European Union, the European institution can take in order to preserve what the good things that international trade created and reduce the negative uh, the negative effect that has been witnessed during during the last years, not not only during the pandemic, because we had we we already knew that globalization created some imbalances even before the pandemic. But the the idea is to create a better environment in which we can reduce the negative aspect and maximize the positive ones. In this, uh, in this uh, uh, open consultation, uh, these, all these ideas are included. And uh, um, uh, it's clear that uh, the European institutions need to uh, cope with, need to face uh, some external challenges which are related to uh, the volatility of international relations and that is clear uh, we we just experienced uh, the change or what happened during the US elections uh, and uh, just to mention uh, the very recent uh, episode that uh, of course have, have a very uh, important impact uh, on international relations as a well, whole and of course also on uh, on uh, European Union uh, and uh, uh, we, we, uh, the European Union is also uh, is also aware of the fact that trade has been used in the last uh, in the last uh, four years uh, at least uh, as a weapon. So we we experienced a weaponization of uh, of trade, and uh, uh, this just to mention the biggest external challenge that the European Union is facing. On the other, on the internal side, uh, there are also challenges, and I mentioned before the fact that, uh, for example, also Europeans, a lot of European citizens are not satisfied with uh, the outcomes of international trade, and they don't consider an um, uh, equal distribution of benefit uh, among the, the entire population. And for this reason, uh, an opposition, a strong opposition against uh, international trade and globalization rose around Europe in every single country around the world but also uh, in uh, in Europe and uh, um, 
COVID, uh, COVID exacerbated all these uh, challenges, uh, both the internal and, and the external. And for this reason, it's really important for the European Commission and the European institution to find a new way of dealing with uh, all these challenges, uh, keeping in mind the fact that uh, in globalization and cooperation and, multi and multilateralism are our core values because we think that we cannot face such huge challenges without having an attitude of cooperation, of global co cooperation. Um, the, the two other main dossier on which the European Union is dealing with is that are um, the, 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 the European Green Deal and the, G the digital transformation and trade it can be a very, very effective tool for, um, for to, to create better condition in order to put in place action, real action, and to implement uh, these two agenda on climate and uh, digital. So all these uh, policies are really very much interconnected. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to uh, um, uh, mention uh, uh, w which, what, uh, which are, I think, are the other uh, challenges, uh, the other um points uh, most important mm -hmm. points on which the european institution mm -hmm. need to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, work on mm -hmm. um for uh, for the future uh, first of all i cannot uh, um i cannot neglect uh, mm -hmm. uh, all the dossier related to the brexit i don't have time now to enter into the details uh, but of course this is another huge element that the european institutions are dealing with because of course uh, in terms of international trade uh, brexit is is having and will have a huge impact um, the uh, um, following uh, the following point uh, is the new course that uh, the um, election of uh, Biden in the U.S. will give to uh, U.S.-EU relation that in the mm -hmm. in the last four years have been really very very difficult on some aspect um, the European uh, uh, on some aspect that this relation uh, will be. Uh, um, anyway uh, difficult but i think that uh, the message and the position that joe biden already uh, took on some aspect will could give a new uh, a new input to a new uh, boost to the relation between eu and uh, and the us i completely disagree with uh, the uh, those analysts and opinionists who are saying that nothing will change or very little will change I think that a lot will change, even if uh, probably Biden won't have uh, in at, at the beginning at the top positions in uh, his agenda international trade, because of course uh, he uh, uh, he is uh, inheriting a, a country that is really um, in a very very dire straits, and he needs to work a lot on the reunification uh, of uh, American citizens that has been divided ideologically so much with such a hate um, a, 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 a position of confrontation uh, confrontation uh, in, instead of uh, uh, conciliation and uh, and uh, cooperation so I, I'm uh, I'm convinced of the fact that he will devote the beginning of his mandate on internal issues but he cannot mm -hmm. avoid to um, put a, a, a great effort also on uh, international on in on his international agenda on international trade also because things elsewhere are going on such quickly uh, such a, in a, such a, uh, in a in a rapid manner that it what it won't be impossible for him not to do it, deal with them and i arrive at my last point and this is a clear example of what is going on what what big revolution are going on elsewhere in the world that calls uh, also um, uh, the us 
and Europe. And uh, as I mentioned before, I, I want to conclude my intervention this morning uh, with uh, the um, signature that occurred uh, um, a few days ago, uh, last uh, last weekend, uh, of the of the partnership. Uh, um, among 15, 15 countries in the ASEAN region, including the ASEAN, uh, all the ASEAN countries, the 10 ASEAN countries, um, China, New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, and Japan, uh, meaning the biggest ever uh, trade agreement uh, um, uh, concluded uh, in uh, uh, the history of uh, our our planet, uh, including 30% uh, of the population of the world, 28% of the GDP. So it's really a huge, a huge event. Um, and also on that, I disagree on the, on, uh, uh, with uh, those uh, analysts saying that it won't change so much because uh, the uh, RCIT uh, is just uh, um, uh, somehow uh, a systemization of what is already in place. I don't think so. I think that it's a very, very um, revolutionary um, uh, step forward. And uh, I think that uh, this is also a wake up call for the European Union on some on, on some on some aspect. It's also it's a, a way of uh, ratifying the fact that uh, the values uh, on which uh, the international uh, um, attitude of the European Union is uh, confirmed. Uh, the European Union also in the worst period continue to work for create cooperation and never left uh, the multilateral approach. And this is uh, somehow a confirmation of what the European Union has done during the past years. So this is a really very, very important political message on which the European Union has something to say. Uh, second, the European Union um, had already a strategy for being very much interconnected with most of the countries that are now um, uh, connected with uh, this new partnership. Uh, just mentioned that the European Union uh, concluded the, uh, in the, the last years a very important agreement with South Korea, with Japan, with Vietnam, with Singapore, and it's now concluding the agreement with, uh, with uh, Australia and New Zealand, just to mention the ones that are more or less at the end of the negotiation, but and uh, and uh, uh, the um, yeah, the uh, uh, ambassador uh, from Indonesia will uh, will underline that we are also very positive uh, in the talks that we are having with Indonesia, and Indonesia is our next hope to conclude uh, this uh, uh, this connection. Uh, so I uh, um, I think that uh, Europe has also on that something to say because uh, he was already in the strategy of the European Union to look at this area of the world because it has been considered strategic already uh, some years uh, some years ago and um, I think also that uh, this could uh, um, give the opportunity to the European Union to uh, foster, to boost our dialogue elsewhere uh, in order to create uh, this uh, global set of rules uh, that uh, could be the framework in each a fairer and a, a stronger um, trade uh, that is also caring uh, of uh, sustainability of uh, climate change of uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, labor rights and human rights could really be the new normal for uh, cooperation and um, and uh, um, uh, and relations uh, all uh, among the different uh, countries all over the world i think that i'm running out of time i hope that uh, with this general overview uh, this could help the discussion that uh, you are having uh, afterwards i will follow uh, i i try to follow the uh, the uh, the uh, the next uh, conversation but as uh, valerio 
told you I can't be uh, present uh, uh, in a video uh, due to medical uh, medical reasons in this moment we are all uh, always testing ourselves in order to uh, <laughs> to be uh, uh, safer and safer uh, but uh, um, I uh, I'm more than happy to answer some question uh, if there are uh, and if not, I just uh, really want to thank uh, again uh, uh, Confindustria Sicilia and the University, uh, and the University of Palermo and Valerio for the organization because I think it's a really a great opportunity to talk about this issue that I think are really so important and it's really important uh, to uh, uh, follow that because uh, uh, our lives uh, uh, will be uh, conditioned and uh, defined also by what is going on around the world. So it's really important to enlarge our, our overview and to keep uh, an eye always uh, on uh, uh, things that are happening uh, uh, in places that seems to be very far away from us, but they are not. Grazie Alessia, thank you Alessia. Before you leave, I would like you to comment uh, on the fact that the, um, the first high-level press release from the EU uh, about the regional um, uh, comprehensive economic partnership was from the high representative from uh, for external relations, so Joseph Borrelli, uh, instead of the trade commissioner, uh, it's something that you know maybe trade is becoming the main tool of external relation or geopolitics. Can you comment a little bit on that, Alessia? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I, I, I have been always convinced that trade uh, has been uh, the strongest uh, tool uh, of external relation of the European Union, also because of, also for technical reasons, uh, the uh, trade policy is uh, uh, one of the two of the only two uh, poli policies uh, uh, where the European Union has uh, the unique, the sole responsibility. So the competence uh, is completely 100% in the hands of the European institutions. And that gives uh, to the European institution a great power. Uh, so I have been always convinced that uh, trade is the most important uh, tool for uh, external and, uh, and uh, international relation of the European Union. Moreover, uh, this is also um, uh, the proof that uh, um, in this that this uh, European Commission is really very much geopolitical. So this is the first or this is one of the proofs that uh, uh, the European Union is looking more and more uh, outside uh, its own borders and it's uh, trying to reach a new way of cooperating with uh, the, the rest of the world because the challenges I, I we already said the challenges we are facing are so huge that even the European Union even if it's so big it's not enough uh, to uh, uh, to be effective so climate change digitalization the, the new uh, the new uh, uh, all the transformation we are living in uh, and, and the pandemic is a clear and another clear example of that so all the transformation we are living in needs the largest scale possible and for this reason uh, it's important for the european union to be a real global actor and to say its word its words in, as the strongest way possible thank you very much again alessia and as we are uh, moving uh, sorry. Just, uh, just a question um, uh, alessia sorry um I mean, uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really, really interesting to me, and, 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 I'm, open, and I'm sure also for uh, all the attendees. I, I wonder, um, I mean, uh, you spoke about a new course, a new deal, right? Of, uh, uh, in, in, I mean, multilateralism uh, in trade of European Union due the, the pandemic, right? You mentioned these. Uh, uh, this uh, commission report of 16 of June, right, in, in terms of uh, um, a public consultation, right, to uh, implement a, a new course in terms of a more fair international trade. And, uh, and obviously, European uh, Green Deal as well as digital transformation uh, do represent a, a very interesting and fascinating uh, uh, challenges for uh, international trade. However, um, at least for my humble experience, uh, we, we have been experiencing, uh, um, I mean, a, a negative feeling towards globalization as well. 
and, uh, and, and we have to address this kind of, just because, I mean, we uh, all experience, uh, as, at least uh, as a, um, uh, from a, a, very, a very practical point of view, um, several backlash uh, of, of uh, globalization, for example, unfair competition, right? Um, for, um, I'm referring just an example, just also for the benefit of my students, or um, um, a bilateral agreement be, between European and Morocco, right that disrupt our production in terms of uh, food agriculture right so uh, compromise our uh, our uh, uh, competitive efforts in the global market just because we receive uh, products uh, uh, cheaper than more cheaper than than our so this kind of aspects that was uh, um, for a long time addressed also by Trump right I am a supporter of globalization but I am pretty aware about this problem right in terms also and this problem uh, uh, differently from a first moment for a first period I mean decades ago in which uh, everyone were uh, were enthusiastic about globalization today we have been experienced I mean some uh, uh, critical doubts about how globalization work and I I'm fear that uh, European uh, Green Deal right or digitalization right um, could be uh, not enough uh, I mean uh, elements right for launching a new course a new course in the direction of more fairness in international trade uh, I mean, aside from the rhetoric of the European Commission, sorry, <laughs> just because I mean, I, I think that we had strong problem to address for, uh, um, I mean, uh, keeping back globalization in the in, in the core, in the spirits of the people that uh, that do, do do trade and also I mean live in in each country, right? Uh, I mean, so uh, I wonder, and, and that's it, if uh, in this uh, uh, consultation, in this new uh, attention of the European Commission for Multilateralism in Trade, um, due to the pandemic, there was a, a, a specific attention to the uh, backlashes of uh, uh, globalization, uh, unfair competition, or, and, 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 and so on and so on. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's exactly one of my points when I mentioned the fact that uh, globalization has in the last year started to have less and less support everywhere in the world and also uh, very much in uh, in Europe because uh, there has been not uh, the impression uh, of uh, an equitable distribution of benefit. So that, that has been the point, the fact that globalization did not distribute it, um, fairly uh, the benefits so uh, that created uh, more inequalities uh, than uh, than before the consultation uh, is is only a consultation so it's not a concluded document yet so after the consultation the commission will release uh, a, a, a strategy uh, but included in the consultation there are it's really clear this point and the, the commission is asking all the people to to provide ideas in order to find solution to that what i can tell to answer your your question is that what we have to work on is to create a set of rules that are strong enough to reduce uh, to reduce uh, the imbalances and to reduce um, uh, unfair competition because what we are living in and what we lived in the past as a, a negative um, a negative aspect of globalization has been the fact that rules were not accepted everywhere and the European Union had to uh, uh, to face an unfair competition competition from all over the world so for this reason it's so important to push on on in a large and multilateral cooperation and for this reason it's so important to um, push all the other all the efforts that we have on the multilateral platform for example the WTO that in these years that Mr Trump uh, tried to uh, uh, to uh, to kill uh, because he didn't give the support on that we don't we cannot we cannot find solution that just close our markets in 
were in walls and uh, uh, hoping that this uh, could create a better environment for everybody because uh, international we are so interconnected that markets goods and service will transit anyhow and it's much more important to have very clear and very strong rules that are accepted by, by everybody than hoping to uh, close uh, the exchange of goods the person and services that is impossible is all is as trying to stop water with with the hands that it's not possible also because we are in a digital era we where uh, the transition the exchanges of both goods and services is even more uh, is even easier than before and the, the second aspect, it's so important to connect uh, trade and uh, digitalization because uh, the most, the biggest inequalities uh, that uh, um, raised during the past years came from uh, digitalization and technologization more than, uh, than from trade. Also because uh, on digitalization, uh, the set of rules is well behind the level of implementation and the level of uh, innovation because the innovation the technical innovation went on so quickly that the set of rules that we had needed time to be modernized and in the meantime there's there was a sort of a vacuum in our rules and for that uh, it was easier to create uh, the loophole where uh, where uh, rights and a fair situation was not uh, was not protected enough Thank you very much. Okay, thank you again, Alessia. Um, I think now that... I think I have to switch uh, and to leave you at least by video. Uh, thank you again, uh, and I really hope to to meet you in person very very soon. All of you. Grazie. Bye bye, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Ciao, Silvia. Bye. So, uh, Alessia moved from uh, globalization toward European politics. And we have to arrive at a certain point to talk about ASEAN and Indonesia. So, Silvia, you're the perfect link between the two uh, speakers, Alessia and the Ambassador Andayani. Uh, we are happy to hear your views and your uh, expertise. You are the, working in the ASEAN desk of the Director General for Trade of the European Commission. So, you're the actor of the trade policy. Uh, of the European trade policy and I would like to know uh, from you uh, something more about the European trade policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the ASEAN and of course the ASEAN countries. Silvia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Valerio. Buongiorno to all. Um, and thanks to, as always, to Italia ASEAN, to Suci Industria, to the University of Palermo for, for organizing this, for inviting the European Commission. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and I think it's it's really, I mean, I, of course, because I'm a bit biased, so I always think that it's fascinating to talk about trade policy and trade policy between Europe and Asia. But I think that this is a particularly exciting moment. We just heard about recent developments. There, there's a lot moving uh, about trade policy as a whole, about developments in Asia, about uh, governance in other countries, in other big players on the international economic scene. So I think it's, it's, it's really the right time to have these conversations now. Um, also, I think that, well, I'll try to be a bit the, the transition element, as you said, Valerio, in between uh, the bigger picture and maybe a bit more of a specific country example. So I'd like to use, to take a bit of time to, to talk about, uh, to give a bit of an overview about uh, EU ASEAN trade relations, maybe to spend a few words with some concrete examples from some of our trade agreements with Southeast Asian countries, and then maybe to, to share a few thoughts and open questions on, on the way ahead. Um, so let me maybe start a bit with the context about ASEAN, um, just to recall how much of a dynamic region it is in terms of growth, in terms of population, uh, in terms of developments over the last years. I think it's a very uh, unique uh, group of countries. It's, it's very cohesive, but it's also very diversified. We have advanced economies, uh, upper and middle income economies, emerging economies, and LDC. So it's a very rich group. Um, it's also the fifth economy in the world. Uh, it has a population of 650. 650 uh, 50 million with a very uh, young component and a growing middle class. 
Uh, it has had, well now okay, COVID has, has had its impact, but it has had a very sustained uh, growth rate over the last years, which is quite impressive. And of course, it has a very strategic position. So I said it's, it already is a block of many countries, but also has a very important position vis-a-vis -vis other important partners in the region. It's really in between some giants like China, India, and also if you look a bit more to the East, uh, Korea, Japan, and others. So I think it, it really has a crucial position. Like it's no surprise with all of this context that trade relations between the EU and ASEAN have been strong and long lasting over the last decades. And just to give just to give a couple of, I think, very telling figures, uh, I think it's enough to recall that ASEAN as a bloc is the third trade partner for the EU worldwide, and the EU on its side is the second trading partner for ASEAN. So just to, to, to confirm how strong our trade ties already are, both on goods and on investment, of course. Um, however, the story doesn't end there. So we already, we already work together a lot, uh, but I think that it's also important to recall how much ASEAN has been a priority of the EU trade policy over the last, at least the last 15 years, if not more. I'm taking the last 15 years because there, there are some important developments in that time period. So maybe I'll take the opportunity to do a bit of a, of a quick overview on the main steps, so that the milestones in this in this process. And maybe let me just say, because I think it's 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 a nice complement to what was mentioned just before that. Trade policy, I think, has a lot to do with exactly creating the right frameworks and the right environments for trade to prosper, but also for trade to be beneficial to all. I think it's just a matter of fact, it's a matter of life that trade happens. I mean, it has happened since the very beginning of human history, and it will keep happening. And that's what Alessia was saying. I mean, it, it can't be stopped. Uh, I'm, I'm not entering into whether it should or shouldn't, but just to say that I think that a lot of, of also the, the debate about globalization very often tends to overlook a bit the fact that trade is there, trade is pushed forward by individuals, by companies, because it's sort of a natural component of, of our way of seeing societies. The thing with trade policy is not that much about creating globalization that otherwise wouldn't exist, but trade policy is really about how to make the most out of it, how to create a framework, how to have rules, predictability, stability, so how to make it somehow managed in a better way uh, so that it can really deliver to at the maximum its positive impacts and keep under control the, the negative impacts. There's, there's a very old, old book from when I was a student in, in international economics, which I think has a beautiful title, which is really like trade policy about harnessing globalization. And I think that's a very good idea. It's the idea of harnessing in a way of, you know, uh, it's there and you want to really steer the course so that it delivers uh, on its positive potential. But okay, so that, that was a bit of a side note. Uh, back to EU trade policy vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN. Um, I'm taking a bit, I, I said 15 years, because uh, I'm taking as a starting point Global Europe, which has been one of the first trade policy communication in modern times, let's say, by the European Commission. It's a very important part because it, it essentially marks the, the time when European trade policy also opened up to bilateral to preferential trade agreements. Up until then, it had been very much anchored into the WTO, focused on the WTO. That's still there, don't get me wrong. I think WTO remains really the key element and the first priority, especially nowadays with the WTO facing a deep crisis. So there's, there's really a lot of work and then remains one of our key objectives to make sure that the WTO can be strengthened, reformed, and remain operational at the core of the multilateral trading system. But Global Europe in 2006 also looked into the opportunities and how the EU trade policy should also cater for preferential trade agreements. And I think it's very telling that at that time, there were, if I remember correctly, three areas that, that were three um, processes of negotiations that were highlighted. and out of those two, were, it was a lot about Asia. So there was Asia, there was Korea, there was India, and there was the ASEAN region. Uh, Korea has been the first modern FTA that the EU has concluded. It's up and running, uh, and, and, uh, and it's set a bit open the way and the path for, for other negotiations to follow. India, the negotiations with India were launched at the time and have been 
uh, facing uh, different uh, events over the course of time that have not been finalized and are not very active these days and uh, also right after uh, the adoption of this communication in 2006 and 2007 the EU also opened negotiations on trade on a trade agreement with ASEAN as a bloc so the idea was really to to forge a region to region uh, trade agreement negotiations went on for a couple of years 2007 to 2009 when it became apparent that uh, there were, let's say, different levels of readiness on the other side to engage into this deal, there were different objectives, and maybe it would take a bit longer to come to uh, full convergence in terms of the level of ambition and the scope of a trade agreement between the two regions, and hence it was decided to put on hold negotiations between the EU and ASEAN as a whole and rather give way to bilateral agreements, bilateral negotiations with individual members of ASEAN. Um, this, just to clarify, did not mean moving away from the idea of regional integration, so region to region, but it was really seen as a sort of a more um, progressive process whereby we would build block by block, step by step, a network of bilateral deals that would then somehow provide the basis to bring everything back together under a regional umbrella. Uh, so that's what we've been busy with over the last uh, 10 years now, because the first bilateral negotiations with ASEAN members uh, were launched in 2010. It was Singapore and Malaysia. And then we moved on to, over the years, to start other bilateral negotiating processes with Vietnam in 2012, with Thailand 2013, Philippines 2015, and Indonesia 2016. Now, as I said, all of this is, 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 is aiming at creating a coherent framework that would pave the way for going back to a regional table in, in the future. Um, the different processes that I mentioned, so all these different bilateral negotiations moved on with their own pace and are nowadays in different stages. I think we have a very nice uh, mix of situations. So we have two agreements that have been concluded and entered into force, those with Singapore and with Vietnam. Maybe I'll come back to that with, with some, some more uh, detailed elements. We have a process which is ongoing, which is the one with Indonesia, and I'm sure that the ambassador uh, will, will, will say more on that. And we have other processes which are for the time being on hold, and those are the bilateral negotiations with the Philippines, Thailand, and Malaysia for different re reasons. So yes, they have their own dynamics, they have their own pace, um, they have their own specificities, but I think it's important to recall how the, the approach that you pursues in these negotiations it's very coherent and it's always aiming at a very ambitious and comprehensive uh, outcome. Um, and that's really going back to what was discussed before. Uh, it's because what we want to, to achieve is to have deals that can really uh, untap the market potential and, and make our trade relations prosper, but that they can also create broader uh, positive business environment, can be uh, can, can, can make our, our respective regions uh, more attractive for business operators, but can also be, bring benefits for society as a whole. So it's not only about businesses, it's also about consumers, about farmers, about, I would say, citizens uh, as a whole. So that's why the trade agreements that the EU is negotiating actually are built around what we call three main pillars. We talk about market access, which is, if you want, more the traditional bread and butter of trade policy, but we also talk about regulatory environment and about rules. I think that the two agreements we have concluded and we have enforced uh, in the ASEAN region, the ones I mentioned with Singapore and Vietnam, can provide very good examples of how we achieved that. Um, by the way, it's, it's, it's quite nice that actually the Singapore FTA celebrates tomorrow, the first anniversary from entry into force. So I think it's very nice to have this opportunity to maybe celebrate a bit uh, what has been achieved there and how this can also be an example for, 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 for future steps. So in both agreements, Singapore and Vietnam, and I prefer to talk about those because they are in force, they've been finalized, so you can also, if you're interested, look up the text and see exactly what's in there, what are the commitments. Um, so there's, of course, there's the, the sort of traditional component of liberalization in terms of tariffs. So they bring essentially down to zero tariff 
do this on, on, on goods, on uh, traded between the EU and, and the partner countries. They're quite interesting if you look, if you compare Singapore and Vietnam, that the starting points were quite, quite different. So Singapore was basically almost in a full liberalization position, except for very few tariff lines. I always say, however, that of course, when you only have a few tariff lines with duties, it means that those duties are there for good reasons and they're very hard to liberalize. And that's definitely the case. Uh, so, but even on those, we, we managed to agree in this FTA with Singapore to remove those last tariffs on the Singaporean side. Vietnam, we started for a much closer environment with much higher duties and we achieved quite important, uh, meaningful liberalization for all products. Um, including things that are particular of interest to the Italian system, since that's also a bit one of the topics of our conversation. Just to give you a couple of examples, uh, duties on hard paste cheese from 10% going down to zero in over three years, duties on wine going up, going down from 50% to zero over seven years, and also uh, on a number of other food products and other, other, other areas of the agri-food industry, just to mention a few. Um, so that's a bit to give you a sense of how, how key the market access, the traditional liberalization for goods remains at the center of, of our agreements. But it's also important to talk about the other aspects, the, the rules, the procedures that are addressed in our deals, because you can, if you have only market access liberalization, but you don't have the right procedures, and you're not able to use those to, to, to take advantage of those uh, tariff cuts, probably the agreements would not lead to much, or in any case, they would under deliver, underperform compared to their potential. Um, so, cutting red tape is clearly very important in our agreements. So, making procedures easier, more streamlined. For instance, I don't know when it comes to inspecting uh, factories, exporting food products how to maybe agree on smoother systems that can regroup inspections rather than having to go one by one, just to give an example, or how to agree on easier uh, rules on labeling so that, of course, consumers are safe, they can read the labels, but at the same time, for operators, it's not too much of a headache how to have to comply with 2,000 different requirements. On rules, uh, I think a dimension which is very important and which is uh, which has a high economic value and is quite innovative, is the whole area of intellectual property. Uh, it goes about designs, about copyrights, about at the end of the day, it's really about innovation. And of course, we have traditional economy, we have, of course, manufacturing, but we also know that the future is more and more, if we want to move up the value chains, it's more and more about protecting and fostering innovation. So in, uh, intellectual property rights are quite, quite key there. And there's also a specific angle of intellectual property, which is which is very dear to uh, to Italy and to Europe as a whole, which is the whole area of um, geographic indication. So the denominazione di origine protetta in Italian, which of course has, has, has quite uh, uh, an important role to play in the Italian econo econ economy and an export model. So I think that Agreements concluded by the EU, the ones with Singapore and Vietnam, are a very clear example of how, how strong an agreement can be in ensuring protection and recognition for uh, geographical indications also on third markets. That's to the benefit of the producers. It's, of course, also to the benefit of consumers who can have more clarity and, and more choice and higher quality. Last couple of elements still talking about the Singapore and the Vietnam agreements. But again, it's an, just an example of uh, EU trade policy as a whole, vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia and more broadly. It's more the, the, the area of broader governance, level playing field, and so on. I think that there are a lot of innovative areas that are also tackled in our agreements, such as competition, state-owned enterprises, so really how to make sure that all the different sides of the economy are somehow looked at when it comes to uh, creating a good framework for trade uh, under an FTA. And of course, when we talk, we go even broader than that, and we, we take a look at the, the overall governance framework, and that's, that's and also all this sort of developments in trade policy, again, what was recalled before about the need to make sure that trade is it's fair, it's fair not only in terms of, you know, no dumping and so on, but it's also fair in terms of looking at 
societal values such as labor and environment. And that's why the EU has been at the forefront in pushing uh, provisions on trade and sustainable development in its trade agreements to make sure that increased trade does not come at expenses of workers' rights or environmental protection, but actually, on the other hand, can even contribute to that by promoting trade in green goods, by uh, enabling uh, good working conditions and so on. So I think that all in all, it was a bit of a very quick uh, running through a number of elements in our agreements. I hope that at least it's, it, it, it creates some curiosities about what's in there and it can encourage people to have a closer look at that. And, and I'm now moving to the last part. It's just two, three elements for future reflection. So one is, um, of course, we have these agreements. How do we make them work? So a lot of the focus now is going into implementation. The more agreements we negotiate, the more we need to make sure that we are up to the job and that we really make good use of them. That's for public authorities, but it's even more so for economic operators and for any interested actor to really make, make sure they can use them and they can take the opportunities which are there. So that's one. Second, it's a bit more on the negotiation side, which is the complaint on how to strengthen, expand and deepen the network that we have. As I said, we are engaged as European Union negotiations with a number of countries in, in Southeast Asia. So I think that we also we are quite keen in moving forward with that. Uh, and again, Indonesia is now the, the case in point with an active negotiation, which, which is ongoing. But as I said, we also have other processes with other countries that I think we would be uh, keen on, on resuming and moving forward if we can uh, have reasonable reassurances that we can deliver on very ambitious and comprehensive deals. Um, finally, there's a bit, the, that's the final point, it's the broader picture, which was already mentioned, but I think that it's important to, you know, to also take that into account, which is a bit the overall reflection on how do we deal with the post-COVID environment, how do we make sure that trade can be one of the elements driving the recovery, of course, not the only one, but still an important one. And that's also the context in which we, we, we have this ongoing uh, exercise of reviewing European trade policy that Alessia referred to with a consultation that has just been concluded and now work going on for uh, coming up with a revised EU trade strategy at some point early next year. I think we do have we do have questions, we do have a lot of work ahead of us. I think we, we start from a good basis. We do have a number of elements which are already there. And of course, uh, I think that maybe the concluding note is what was recalled that uh, if we work together, we have higher chances of succeeding. Like that, with that, I would pass the floor back to Valerio and of course, looking forward to the other speakers on the panel and to questions later on. Thank you very much, Silvia. Your very clear in explaining uh, the complex EU trade policy. So thank you very much. If you agree with me, uh, we can pass the floor to Ambassador Andayani, and then we do the Q&A session all together. Uh, we are already collecting some, some questions, so uh, it would be nice to do everything at the end. Uh, I see you're smiling, so I think you would agree. You're, you agree with me. Uh, so um, Ambassador Andayani, uh, I'm glad and honored to have you here. Um, as you as you see and as you will explain to us, there's a multi-level multi -level relation. Italy and Indonesia, uh, Italy and the ASEAN, EU and Indonesia, and EU and the ASEAN. Uh, can you try to, to clarify the situation for us and give us the, the position of your embassy and of your country? Uh, I'm sure it will be uh, a very interesting presentation. So the floor is yours, and I will put uh, your screen uh, on. Thank you very much. All right, all right. Thank you very much, Valerio. First of all, of course, thank you for Italy ASEAN Associations working together with the University of Palermo and Sicindustria to organize this webinar. Uh, it is my honor to be part of these virtual discussions talking about the geoeconomic relevance of Southeast Asia for the Italian country systems. So uh, like uh, you just mentioned that it is discussed about Italy and Indonesia, 
uh, at the same time as uh, EU and Indonesia relations. I would like to start with the, some context, in particular the current pandemic, uh, economic situation during this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic era. Uh, as we all know, COVID-19 uh, really giving our economic a huge blow. There are no countries in the world immune to these pandemic situations, but I believe we start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Heartening announcements of the positive results of COVID-19 vaccines are cautiously welcome. Istat just recently estimating that Italy GDP will rebound around 16% in the third quarter, comparing to the previous quarter, minus 4.7% uh, year on year. Several key sectors like agriculture, industry, and service is recovering. Similar conditions also apply in Indonesia. In the third quarter, Indonesia's economy rebounds 5% from previous quarter, minus 3.5% year on year. For ASEAN region, IMF has projected that real GDP growth will be contracted to 3.3% before rebound to 6.1% in 2021. Against those backgrounds, the message we get is that while we must be optimistic, we must work hard to widen and deepen our two countries' cooperations. Let me start with uh, our bilateral relations, I mean uh, Indonesia and Italy. Italy is the third largest trade partner after Germany and the Netherlands of Indonesia in the European Union with more than 3.5 billion US dollar of our total trade last year. I believe that Italy and Indonesia still have a lot of room to improve their economic relations. This is because despite the bilateral trade, dynamic Indonesia and Italy economies and export commodities complement each other. There are numerous potentials to develop supply chain in process industry. For example, machinery and electrical equipment supply chain, electric cars, coffee, cosmetic and fashion, pharmaceutical and vegetable oil. On foreign direct investment or FDI, most of the Italian investment in Indonesia in terms of number of projects are services with hotel and restaurant leading with 42% of total projects of Italian investment since 2014. Meanwhile, in terms of value, the most valuable investment of Italy comes from trade and repair service uh, services with 32 uh, percent and uh, no i mean comes from trade and repair surf uh, services uh, with 32 percent uh, and rubber and plastic industry with 31 percent expansions of bilateral investment between indonesia and italy is very likely to increase in the future one of the reasons is Indonesia just recently passed job creation law or commonly known as omnibus law. The main core of um, omnibus law is a simplification of permit procedures and bureaucracy. Hyper regulations uh, is one of the most uh, hurt complaints that we receive from potential investors. With this omnibus law, Indonesia's rank on ease of doing business is projected to climb from 70-30 to 50-30 in the world. This omnibus law harmonizes and simplifies regulations on several sectors, including employment, permit, research and innovations, SMEs, land acquisitions, and more. Omnibus law will facilitate businesses, FDI, and support economic development agenda, 
focuses on Indonesia's role on the global chain amidst the trend of low carbon economy. The other reason why I believe that our bilateral relations will be improved is the already mentioned by Delphia, uh, uh, is the Indonesia-EU-EU Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which brings me to the second part of my remarks about Indonesia and EU relations. Economic relations between Indonesia and EU is fluctuated on the last three years. In 2019, total trade between Indonesia and EU declined to 14% compared to 2018. I hope when Indonesia-EU TEPAS negotiation is concluded, economic relations between two sides can enhance significantly. Similar like with Italy, Indonesia and EU also have many complementarities. Indonesia's products, such as uh, our agriculture, mechanical and manufacturers, can cater more people in the EU market. The agreement will also facilitate more reciprocal investments between the two, two sides. We hope that trade barriers will be lowered with this agreement. It is unfortunate that there are still misunderstandings with regard to some of our products, uh, that is including uh, palm oil. This misunderstanding result in some unnecessary barrier. This in turn has discriminated our palm oil to enter EU market. I need to convey that palm oil industry is one of the industries that is strictly regulated in terms of its sustainability. Palm oil is the only vegetable oil that observes various health, environmental, and social standards. Other vegetable oils do not have these standards. The coverage of forests in Indonesia is in fact larger now. This comes with the preservation of biodiversity. Thus, it is safe to say that negative campaign against palm oil with regard deforestation the loss of biodiversity or health issue is no other than an ethical marketing gimmick. We hope EU public, including all of the panelists, is able to get a broader and right context and information on this issue before making a judgment. I would also like to highlight that palm oil issue has also been discussed under ASEAN-EU framework including the discussion to establish the ASEAN-EU Joint Working Group on this issue. Mutual discussions on this issue is a must to reach our common mutual interest. Before I conclude, let me touch a bit on ASEAN-Italy. Last September, Italy has become an ASEAN development partner. This is a milestone for ASEAN and Italy relations. With total population 660 million people and US dollar 3.2 billion of GDP, ASEAN is one of the key players in global economy. Currently, ASEAN has agreed on terms of reference ASEAN-Italy Development Partnership Committee, and this uh, terms of reference has been submitted to Italy for further comments and inputs. If it is agreeable, the next important step is to del deliberate plan of actions to give substance of this partnership. In this regard, this plan of action should enable greater cooperation of both sides of various fields, political, economy, and sociocultural. I believe there are many potential areas of cooperation uh, can be tapped. I encourage everybody to play an active role uh, in Italy in this endeavor. To conclude, I would like to reiterate that in this unprecedented situation, needs unprecedented resolve and actions by us, like uh, we have to work together, what Sylvia also say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So um, now we are 
almost at the end of our today's discussion, this first round uh, of our seminar about the geoeconomic relevance of Southeast Asia for the Italian country system. Uh, but I would like to um, summarize a bit what we've been passing through. So we had Alessia Mosca talking about how trade and globalization uh, are facing the pandemic, COVID-19, but also the theme of sustainability and digitalization, and as well as uh, the idea of setting rules uh, for creating a better globalization. Then we had Silvia Formentini, who gave us uh, an overview of the history of the EU ASEAN uh, trade relations, and of course, about all the bilateral negotiation going on as building blocks towards a region to region uh, trade agreement. And then, of course, we had the opinion and view of the ambassador, Estian Dayani, who explained a little bit this omnibus law and the improvement of the ease of doing business in Indonesia. And of course, the, the hot topic of the palm oil issue um, with the EU. So I'm glad, I'm glad I had these three. Uh, very wise opinion and now i would like to uh give a little bit of space to questions that have been uh sent through the uh chat and i would say that we have a question for the ambassador andayani a question for silvia formentini and then a question for both of you uh so it's perfect uh first of all i will ask to ambassador andayani uh on behalf of mr cantalupo um if you think uh, there is a, an aspect of the omnibus law who is giving uh, the most uh, uh, potential for uh, foreigners, for foreign investors. Ambassador, you can reply if you want. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. It is, uh, um, it is open, become wide open for the investors to to invest in Indonesia. Uh, this is a lot of complaint before that it is the regulations, the uh, bureaucracy is very long and every, uh, uh, so this is all the regulations now is uh, become uh, cut and become very short. And it is also, uh, you know that in Indonesia, there is uh, decentralizations that sometimes in one, uh, area one region to other region they have their own uh, regulations now we try to make all the uh, regulations is similar and only one windows to have uh, the uh, agreement uh, to do uh, investment in indonesia so hopefully uh, in the near future uh, the investor will be very easy to invest in indonesia so welcome to indonesia thank you thank you ambassador the second question is for silvia formentini uh, it arrives from emir jan kalaj i don't know exactly if i'm pronouncing it correctly or not but silvia the the the, the substance of the question is uh, how does the commission uh, try to keep together the different interests of different member states when negotiating uh, an agreement as a European Union? Yeah, well, I think, th thanks for that. I think it's a question that could apply to all areas of policy making and maybe at European level, maybe trade is a good case to look at because we do have exclusive competence. So in a way, when we sit at a negotiating table, the commission is representing all member states and member states are not really directly in there. But, I think the key for that, the key for success is, is a lot of dialogue, a lot of communication in the process. So let's not forget that the Commission doesn't negotiate on its own initiative. The Commission negotiates upon a mandate by member states that has to be agreed upon. Um, the Commission uh, has, um, has a very um, a thorough policy of debriefing uh, member states before and after negotiating rounds and of course of consulting member states throughout the whole process. 
Uh, side note, by the way, that also applies to the European Parliament. Huh? And let's not forget that member states are one of the decision makers, one of the lawmakers in the EU, one of the legislators, I would say, but the other legislator is the European Parliament, who also needs to get then give a final say on agreements uh, and uh, has the same, uh, towards which the Commission has the same approach of debriefing communication and transparency. Uh, I'm saying this because also in the European Parliament you do have national interests represented. So of course there, there are the, if you want, the political divides among political groups in the parliaments, but there are also very strong mandates from, from national constituencies. So I think that in a way that enables the Commission to get a lot of inputs, to get a very good perspective, a very good understanding on the interests of member states in the Council, in the Parliament, and in any event through broader contacts and consultations. And then in a way, it's always a bit of, um, um, yeah, how do you strike the, the balance in between the different, uh, the different uh, objectives? I would not say, maybe, maybe I think maybe that's, that's, that's an observation which can be useful here. I don't think that there are conflicting objectives. I've not been, at least not myself, I'm not aware of trade negotiations where member states had conflicting objectives saying i don't know we need to open up in this area no we don't need we, we need to keep it closed i think that the point is more about uh which are the priorities i think that the idea maybe the the the, the difficult job for the commission in that sense in order how to bring it all together is maybe more in terms of sequencing and in terms of devising the right strategy on, on priorities so I don't think we have, yeah, we need to say yes or no to something. I think we need to find the right way to put the pieces together and where do we start? What's our negotiating capital? What's also the logical sequence in addressing things? Is it, for instance, to get to point B, uh, will it get easier if we first address another issue? Or is it easier if we start with that one? So I think it, it, it's, not a, it, it, it's not possible to give a general answer on it. There's no formula. It's not like we put everything in, push a button, and then it comes out. But I think uh, the, the method is there. And the method is, as I said, it's consultation and a lot of inclusiveness in the process. And then the sort of the, the craft uh, of the negotiator is into yeah how to prioritize and how to sequence things. Grazie, Silvia. And of course, uh, you know uh, when I was a, when I was a young trainee at DG Trade, uh, I, I learned that the, the mandate is given from the Council to the European Commission to negotiate. Uh, and in this month, we are having the German presidency who stated that Indonesia is one of the top priority of negotiation. So I think we are in the right, uh, we are discussing this in the right moment for sure. Uh, I have another question for both of you. Um, it's a, it's a, mm, a general question, but you, I think you can easily comment on that uh, from uh, Ms. Matsei, uh, asking if cultural diplomacy can foster or uh, make it easier uh, trade negotiation and in general international relations. Uh, Ambassador, if you want to be the first one to comment on that, and then of course Silvia, please. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. Uh, with this, uh, uh, I think cultural diplomacy can be one of the tools to make it uh, uh, easier to 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 make uh, have uh, some. Uh, 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 some same perceptions, how we see uh, the, uh, the thing, the, the, the uh, something. Uh, for example, through food. Food, everybody uh, see food, not see food, the food. <laughs> Uh, because it is important. Everybody to, to believe have to have a food. But then uh, how to make the food and how to see, how to taste, every country have their own uh, 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 to, to, to make it. Uh, different culture have difference. And this is also about them to see the ingredients. Then we go to the we can say about the agriculture, about the uh, uh, 
environment about everything on that but because we try to approach through the same thing that it is culturally close to all the human being then it is easier to discuss uh, even this is the way that sometimes we are very hard in the table of negotiations but when we are going to have lunch or dinner together then everything become more relax and everything suddenly can be agreed this has happened so i don't know sylvia maybe can tell more because now she is still uh, involved on that negotiations of course i'm also in foul <laughs> but we are discussing about healthy diet and everything and then we go to also to about the commodities about the everything but then again the culture and diplomacy is one of the tools that make people again see that we are all actually have the same uh, uh, goals. goals so uh, this is what I, uh, I can share with you how we as a people as a diplomat as a negotiators can use the cultural to make our perceptions become the same and we can reach the goal together thank you thank you ambassador silvia the floor is yours yeah, well, I think that this is the, when, when we think about this, that's when you really regret that due to circumstances we can't meet in person and then go for a nice lunch afterwards. But okay, life is life. Um, so no, I, I fully, I fully support, I fully share the ambassador's views. I think that cultural diplomacy, in the sense of knowing and understanding each other better, is definitely key in negotiations. I mean, you, you, it's very hard to sit at the negotiating table if you realize that basically the messages don't get across and to get the messages across of course i mean there's an issue of being into the negotiations and everybody is there with an interest and in good faith but sometimes many times actually really depends to uh, on on how how much of the same background or understanding of where each side is coming from you can have or not and knowing more about each other broad in in the broad sense not just about the tariff line or that specific regulation but knowing about the system knowing about the rationale knowing about the key players uh, definitely has a very important role in that i would add to that that cultural that diplomacy also has a very important role i think in making implementation better and more effective after we have concluded an agreement and it's enforced and you want people to make use of that and to to really make it alive uh you, it, it, it works better if economic operators understand each other more you you can create a perfect framework for somebody to export a product but if you realize that there's no market for that product because there's no interest because nobody knows about it you don't get very far so the more you can make people aware the more you can share knowledge i think that the better and the more effective this is last comment on that i think it's interesting that one of the buzzwords in, in international economics international trade over the last three four years has been a lot of this notion of connectivity and of course at the beginning a lot of people thought oh, connectivity is about infrastructure it's about building the railways or the poor so that things can be travel and be connected from one place to the other i think the more and more as the debate is evolving there's more and more focus also on people to people connectivity so really about how to bring people together and it, it goes at the levels i talked about economic operators and exporters that that's a bit my bread and butter but it also goes about erasmus students about exchanges of academics it's really about this notion of exchanging and connecting not only the goods not only the services but also the people behind that thank you thank you very much silvia so we are almost running out of time i would ask if salvatore professor casabona has a question to ask to our guests to our panelists if not thank you, thank you very much valerio just rewards because we are about to have lunch and um uh, I think that the, the topic of a class the, of a cultural diplomacy is, um, I mean, um, under my vision, uh, really a key topic. And um, 
uh, at least at university, we had a, mm, a pretty interesting experience about cross fertilization and also matching uh, um, um, different kind of point of view. For example, uh, very often during the, the master degree, enter, um, the students uh, that are uh, uh, is an international classroom uh, as a great opportunity to uh, keep in contact with entrepreneurs. Italian entrepreneurs as well as foreign entrepreneurs um, and this thanks to Sich Industria that sometimes leave the floor to the students to meet in a B2B uh, meeting and, and sometimes students I mean support to some extent Jada, Jada is smiling but I know that uh, I mean she support us uh, uh, in so many respects it was a really a great experience really a great experience sometimes for example uh, two years ago we had a, a students uh, that um, came from Pakistan and uh, we had a meeting in um, uh, maybe Camera di Commercio, in, I mean, Chamber of Commerce. And over there, we, we met uh, Sicilian entrepreneurs, uh, the ambassador of Pakistan over there. And to some extent, uh, that student, uh, I mean, um, did represent in that context uh, a bridge. Uh, between, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the diplomacy representatives and the interest over there of, the, of that country and, and, and our entrepreneurs. And this was really, really a great experience. And we did, to some extent, although uh, also in other, in other occasion like uh, B2B organized by Sich Industria, in which our students were extensively involved. And I think that uh, this could be represent um, could represent a way or a really effective uh, uh, cultural diplomacy for fostering trade and also involving the education. Uh, at least my opinion. Anyway, I really I really express my sincere gratitude to the speaker uh, and, and to the panelists, and I leave the floor uh, to Valerio for the conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. So this is just the conclusion of the first round, but I would like to recall that we're going to have a second round next Friday, same time, 11 o'clock. Uh, and again, it will be uh, Associazione Italia SEAM, the University of Palermo, and Tish Industria European Enterprise Network. And next round, we'll see the participation of Vice President of my association, uh, Romeo Orlandi, of the Ambassador of Malaysia, and of the uh, head of the Italian trade agency uh, communication. So um, I hope uh, the next round will be as interesting and as uh, full of content as uh, this one was. I would like to thank again the ambassador of Indonesia to Italy, uh, Ms. Estian Dayani. Thank you very much, ambassador. Your words are always very clear and uh, precious to us. I would like to thank uh, also Silvia Formentini. Silvia, you're a usual guest to us, and I'm very glad to know you and to be in touch with you. And of course, you for you, explaining the EU trade policy is so simple, uh, and for us, it's so simple to listen uh, from you, from your views. I would like, of course, to thank Jada Platania uh, and Sich Industria European Enterprise Network and the University of Palermo, Professor Casabona, thank you very much to you. Uh, we'll also thank uh, Alessia Mosca, who maybe could, uh, maybe is still with us. But in any case, I'll, I'll give my words to her directly. And I would apologize to the guests who uh, sent other questions to us. But as I said before, we're running out of time. So see you next Friday. And thank you very much, for everyone, for participating and for taking the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Take care.